I've been dead five times during my life. Like, I was in this tunnel, and I was sort of like, I could feel all this damp, clam, clammy feeling, and all of a sudden I heard this noise behind me, and it was some rider on a horse, and he was trying to drag me away. My name is Bob Light, um, and I'm 72 years of age. I've been a Christian for 30 years on July the 23rd this year, and I've been clean from heroin for 30 years as well. And this is my story, and I would love to share with you some of the things leading up to becoming a Christian and what's happened to me since then, meeting Jesus. I got registered as an addict in 1967. Somebody injected me with heroin when I was 15. And um, a year later, when I left school, I went to my GP and he prescribed me heroin and cocaine. And uh, this was pharmaceutical stuff back then. And so that was my life, was going to the chemist every day down Boots of Chemist. There were only six of us in Southampton then. And you realise just how much you lose your freedom when you get into drugs. I can't tell you not to do drugs, but like I hope you understand from my story just where it takes you. It took me to all the places I didn't want to be. Drugs just robbed me of 27 years of my life. I don't remember being 18, 19, 20. I don't remember being 21. I don't remember any of it. I didn't want to rob people to get my drugs. So I thought I'd sell drugs to make my drugs. So like every couple of bags of heroin I sold, I would make a bag. And so like that's how I kept my habit going. If, I mean, if I'd had to pay for it, it would have cost me back then two or three hundred pounds a day, which was a lot of money. And then eventually I got busted by the Southampton Drug Squad on Waterloo Station with a large amount of heroin. So I went, I went to court, next minute I'm in a van going to Winchester Prison. And they took me, they, they put me in prison grey, took me straight into the hospital wing, put me in a padded cell for seven days. And then I went back to court again and they, they um, the drug squad said to me, you better come up to our office. And I went to the office and on the table, I could see it, there were seven bags from Boots. So they picked my prescription up while I was in there and they gave it to me. And they said to me, Bob, you're leaving this city one way or the other, you know. And um, in the court case, my, I got put under a, a clinic in West Norwood in London, the only, the only clinic giving heroin prescriptions out. And um, most of the people there are, had legs missing, arms missing, whatever. And that's, that's basically what drugs do to you. You end up losing any love for yourself at all. You know, you take you start taking drugs because you want a buzz, but you take the but you get the buzz and then the buzz goes and then it all turns on you and you want to kill yourself. You know, and I've been dead five times during my life. But I know now Jesus was with me and he helped me through this. It was Easter and they they said to me they didn't have enough methadone to give me, so I had to go back out to Noah Hospital on the ambulance bus and when I was out there they gave me two weeks worth of methadone and I was on a lot of methadone syrup and um, on the way back on the bus I was drinking it and drinking it and drinking it by the time I got back to Shirley in Southampton where I was living my, my first wife turned around and she looked at me and I was blue in colour so, and then, then the ambulance driver, <laughs> bless him, he'd, I'd overdosed three times a week before, so he said to me, fair enough, you know, you, we, we don't want to take him, he obviously wants to die, just let him die. So my wife ran up to Shirley Police Station where they really knew me really well and said, um, you've got to take him. So they took me, they reckon I was brain dead for five minutes. That's the only time I actually remember dying. And I remember like I was in this tunnel 
and I was sort of like, I could feel all this damp, clam, clammy feeling. And all of a sudden I heard this noise behind me and it was some rider on a horse and he was trying to drag me away. But I'm trying to get up the, up the pipe really quick, you know. And then, then I woke up and it was only years later that one of the evangelists who brought me to Christ said to me, you know, Bob, did, was this the rider? and it was a rider of death that's in the book of Revelations. As an addict, I only saw evil. I never saw good. So like, you know, that's why I'm doing this, is to tell you there is good, you know, and he's called Jesus and he can change your life. All those things that hold us back, he can remove them. Even then, I still carried on taking drugs. You know, it's like, Addiction is a terrible thing because it, it just robs you of being able to go here, go there, do what you want to do, you know. It, and it's not like you get a day off. It's 365 days a year. It's Easter, Christmas. Even on Christmas Day I was scoring drugs. You know, it's, it's just your whole life is taken over by this thing that every two hours you've got to inject yourself just to stay normal. And, and it's... And I saw so many of my friends, that most of them died before they were 30, you know. And it just, it, it, it does something to your conscience because, you know, I stayed in squats and the guy next to me would overdose and die. You know, one guy, we wrapped him in the carpet and put him out in the garden because like, at the end of the day, if the police come, they, they do you for attempted murder. They charge you straight away. So like, and it happened to me in Piccadilly toilets. I was with a guy who'd lost half his leg and he injected himself, he turned blue and I had to climb over the top of the toilets to get out because I didn't want to be found with him. And, and there's all this, it just changes your whole perception on life. When I got married to Colette, um, my sister told her, she said, if we knew Bob was coming, we would put away anything that was worth anything. It wasn't because I wanted to rob them, but see, I never looked at things like there was, they were worth any money. It's just a bag of smack to me. <laughs> you know, I'd look, I think, I'll get free bags for that, you know, and stuff, but, you know, and you're doing it, and you just justify yourself, you know, because you're an addict, and your, your life is just totally ruled by this drug. You know, God showed me when I became a Christian that actually heroin was my idol. I didn't need women, I didn't need this, I didn't need that. As long as I had my heroin, I was fine, you know. And most of the time I think I spent 27 years on heroin and my eyes were closed most of the time. So you're being robbed of your life, you know. All the things most people enjoy become a blur to you, really. Because all that's in your head is when you wake up is the next one. Where are you going to get your next fix from? And, you know, today it's even worse because this whole country's flooded with heroin, crack, you know, you know. And it's, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's just destroying people's lives and that, robbing us of, of actually being able to live a normal life. And so like through that, um, I was well known to the home office and the guy who ran the drugs department in the home office, he put me on to the head of the Salvation Army in London who knew me. And um, uh, and he, he found a clinic for me. If I hadn't have found that clinic, I was gonna go to prison for nine years. And so like they put me under the clinic because the, my psychiatrist came down. He had so many letters after his name that they listened to him. He carried on prescribing me, never forced me into doing anything I didn't want to do. And um, so I ended up, I got kicked out of Southampton in a court case for three years. If I came back over the border, I'd be straight in prison, nine years. So they, I lived in Tooting. <laughs> in South London. And it was interesting, you can run 
from all over the country, but your problem goes with you. So like when I moved to Bletchley, which is now part of Milton Keynes, I was living in a place called Shanley Church End, and I walk, the first day I'm there, I go into Bletchley, and within five minutes of getting off the bus, a guy come up to me and ask him if he could score. <laughs> and drugs. <laughs> so like, you can hide, you can run, but if you're an addict, you know another addict, you know, and, and so I learned that really, you, you can't really run away from your problems and, you know, over the years I moved around, but my problems went with me, I only ever stayed a place two or three years and then I had to move because people start working out who you are and what you are. But I ended up living in Cornwall, and I lived down there for 15 years, and that's where I become a Christian. And actually, all around me were Christians. And I was, I had a, two friends, Dave and Tina Cross. My name's Light, their name's Cross. You know, God's got a sense of humor. But it, it's like, between us, 69 years of heroin addiction. And we both, all three of us have been clean for 30 years now, thanks to Jesus. Not willpower, not any of this stuff, it, none of it works. You know, you can try your artist to beat these things through willpower and that, and you know, and people in your family say, well, if you really love me, you'd come off it. It's impossible. Those sort of things just don't work. I couldn't believe it when I, when I didn't really know about Jesus, but when they, when these guys had, from the church in Cornwall as she said to me, Bob, just just ask Jesus into your heart. Everything will change for you. And that's what happened. You know, they they actually did a deliverance thing with me. I had twelve demons cast out on me. I couldn't believe the way I was thinking afterwards. All those voices that I had in my head telling me to kill myself, everything gone totally gone and I couldn't believe I was so surprised I was thinking such nice things <laughs> like, I couldn't believe it I was just thinking well you know like why didn't anybody tell me this before <laughs> you know all my time in Southampton I don't think I ever met a Christian you know and, and it's like you know it, it, it just showed me that there was there was something else in life that really makes a difference and that Jesus did come and he died for us to give us freedom and life, you know. And that's what I've been living. But he sent me back after a year to the te to Southampton. He asked me to go back to the estate where I become an addict. People still remembered me then. There was a lot of threats coming my way about I had a cheat coming back there and all that by the other drug dealers. Um, I got a job in a hostel, 46 bed hostel, Patrick House. Some of my old friends were there. And I, uh, God showed me how free I was, because these guys would throw bags of heroin at me and say, yeah, Bob, you know, because it's, it's funny how it's free when, when they're trying to get you back on it, but you, then you've got to pay. But like, you know, it's, it's nothing for free. And I realized how God had changed me, that it wasn't a problem anymore. It was actually like I'd never done it before. It wasn't just that. The first thing that he actually delivered me from was smoking. And I think that's everybody's first addiction, really, 40 a day. And joints. You know, I always had two or three spliffs in my pocket. And, you know, it, it was all part of my life, really. You know, I always had cigarettes. And it's quite hard to give up smoke. I never really thought about it, to tell you the truth. And, um, you know, when I when this guy came down from Sunderland and he prayed for me and he broke the spirit of nicotine off my life, and I've never smoked a cigarette since. I, I couldn't understand it to begin with because I remember going to the chemist the next morning after this guy prayed for me and somebody lit a cigarette up when I came out and I was thinking, well, oh, that's a bad habit. <laughs> and I was just gonna have an injection. <laughs> I was just gonna have a fix and it's amazing how you think of things, you know. But I 
I realized God was sort of showing me there's no addiction that's too hard for him, you know, and a week or so later I was free. Because they, they, the church fasted and prayed for 40 days for me, individually. And because um, I was on the edge of being sectioned, my psychiatrist in Plymouth said that I'd lost so much weight, I was seven and a half stone, that um, there was nothing, no flesh on me at all, it was just all bones. I couldn't even sit on a chair like this without being in pain. And then I, I had my deliverance and with the pastor's wife's cooking, the next three months I put on about three stone. <laughs> I started to enjoy food because I never used to eat. You know, I couldn't remember actually. I can remember drinking and I can remember I had to get fluids in me. I used to eat sweets. Yeah, I lost all my teeth when I was 21. You know, <laughs> that, was a big, that was a big thing to me. <laughs> You know, I ended up in the South Hands Hospital and I woke up and I had all stitches in my gums. You know, because it takes all the calcium out of your body. That's the thing, is also, it becomes your identity. You know, because when, when these Christians were talking to me about this, I was thinking, well, everybody knows me as a junkie. You know, what am I going to become? <laughs> if I come off all this stuff and that, and what they're telling me is true. And, you know, it, it's under, it's under, you know, I never realized that God gives you everything that becomes new. You get a new identity. You get, you know, I'm Bob Light. You talk to the addicts in Southampton, I'm born again Bob, you know, like I'm, I'm sort of, you know, and I, 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 I'm not ashamed. Uh, of the gospel, I'm not ashamed of what Jesus has done for me, you know, because nobody else could do it. No psychiatrist could renew my mind. I noticed almost straight away that I was thinking differently. I was, everything seemed strangely new to me, you know, and I remember coming out of, I was in this mobile home bit, and it was just a room just a, a room, and I was in there with Barry, who was an evangelist, and Ken McLeod, who was my pastor. And they gave me this piece of paper, and it was the blood scriptures, they called it. And so they said, we want you to read this, Bob. And um, so I started off, and I think the first bit was, um, I have been redeemed out of the hand of the devil by the blood of the Lamb. Well, the minute I got to the word blood, I felt like I was being strangled. And I got thrown to the floor, apparently. But like an hour or so later, 12 demons less, I was laying on the floor with all this, you know, vomit and mucus around me. And I looked up and I could see Ken the pastor and the evangelist just doing a dance and they were celebrating what Jesus had done for me. And actually when you when you actually like later on they wrote it all down for me, they when you actually looked at what demons I had in me, that's why I couldn't break the addiction. That was it. I never I, I, I couldn't even think about taking drugs. You know? And this shows you how much of a change it was. That weekend, I didn't go to the chemist. I didn't pick up my drugs at all. And on the Monday, my um, psychiatrist rang me up and said, Bob, you can't stop that amount of drugs. You would die. I said, I've never felt better in my life. I had a guy in Salt Ash near Plymouth, and he used to come up once a month with a bootload of syringes and needles. Steve, his name was, and he was my drug counsellor. And when he, when, he, when he started coming to see me, all he got was, he had Bible study with me, whether he likes it or not. And I used to have all these scriptures pinned up against the wall and that. And um, he actually came to all the baptisms, to Dave Tina's baptism, my baptism and that. And like, he couldn't believe. He said, I've never known anything like this. You know, and it just really spoke to him that we were so free, you know, because we were so well known by the police. 
you know, they, they used to, we used to go to court and we take our carrier bags because we thought we were going to exit the prison. And like, you know, and, and all of a sudden we started going to court over fines and things like that. And the judge would go, because we've been on the front page of the paper, you know, free junkies set free, you know, boy Jesus. <laughs> and we told the reporter, he better not, because I was only a new Christian, I said, you better ch print every word we say. <laughs> You know, in a threatening sort of way, but like, and he did. So on the front page of the Western Morning News was our picture. Everybody knew us down there. And then the, the courts just started doing amazing things. They could, one magistrate, he came out, we had something like 800 pounds worth of fines. And he said, um, he said, after what we see, what's happened to you guys, he, we were down to 100 pounds. Like, and I could not believe, you know, just we were totally honest about everything. And he just, God just moved for us. Then I started getting phone calls from the police saying, would I go to this bell hostel down in St. Hostel because there's a couple of junkies in there. Do you want to go and have a word with them, Bob? <laughs> this is all from wanting to arrest us and lock us up. It, the whole thing changed around because Jesus changed everything for us. This is it. Re religion can't help you. Only relationship with Jesus can help you. And th this is what he taught us as we went on. You know, when he finally asked me to go back to Southampton, I had nothing. But it, it was just like the minute I said yes to God, it was like he just opened doors left, right and centre for me. You know, I was going out with Colette then. She lived in North Wiltshire in Malmesbury. And I used to drive up there and see her. And then, like, after I said yes to God, that I would come back to the estate. I didn't really want to, deep down, because I would have to face people. I would even have to face the guy who injected me when I was 15. And we've been through a lot together, you know, mental hospitals, prison and stuff. And like, but I realised that Jesus would take care of everything. And that, that weekend when I said yes to God, Colette was a bit upset on the phone. So I said, I'll come up and we'll talk about it. And we went to Swindon Community Church. The preacher didn't turn up. A double glazing guy got up and he shared how he was driving around this house in this day and God said, I want you to come and live here. And they pro he provided a place for him. And then in front of us were, was a, a Christian family, two kids and a mum and, and her husband. They turned around and they told me about the house we ended up living in. And just how God provides everything. He even woke my landlord up and said to him, I want you to drop the rent and I want you not to ask for a deposit. Cause we didn't have a deposit, we didn't have any money at all. And, and just how God provided, you know. And over, over the next coming years, it was like every day, it was like just listening for the Holy Spirit and actually doing what he asked you to do. You know, he asked me once, and we had very little money, and I actually went to the hole in the wall just to have a look to see how much we had. And we had 200, just over 200 pound in there. And he told me to give that 200 pound to this guy who was getting married. And I was thinking, oh, well, what are you gonna do? You know, so I went home and saw Colette, and I said, what do you think, Cole? She said, if he's told you to do it, do it. And we did it. And I didn't do it to get anything back or anything like that. But that next month I had over a thousand pound come in through the letterbox in different amounts, you know, because God knew my situation. I didn't have the money. God's really Jehovah Jireh to me. He's, he provides everything. God, God's so different from what we think. You know, religion makes you see him. He's like all these, all these rules and all this hardness and everything else. But the Jesus I know ain't like that at all. He's actually, he cares about people. He's snatching people back on the brink of death. He's love. He's just totally love. That was the thing that changed my life, really.
was uh, I'd never felt love like that in my life. <laughs> never. You know, he just wrapped around me, and I just I could, I, I, I hadn't cried for twenty odd years. And he started bringing up all the people I knew that died, including my dad. You know, and I just I wept for weeks. I used to have a toilet roll in my car, <laughs> so I could, you know, wipe my eyes and everything and that. He totally changed my heart, you know. I was so hard, you know. I had a seared conscience, I was just, you know, it didn't mean anything to me. But he just changed me, changed my heart. He changed the way I look at people and the way I look at things, you know. And to understand that he loves us so much, he'd do this, if he did it for me, the Bible tells me he'd do it for you. If he did it for me, he'd do it for you. God don't do things once. You look back through history, and he do, he's done all this stuff before. There's nothing new under the sun, it says. You know, and you see that we've got the answer to all the problems. I love the way T.B. Joshua put it. He said he's the greatest sol problem solver, isn't he? You know, they used to sing that song out in Nigeria. And he was another guy that I met that he just showed me that it's all about love. It's about caring for people. But the first time I went to Lagos was 2004. And I, I think I was with you, Chris, when you, we were, both went out there together. And um, I was just amazed at what I saw. It was like biblical days. And I, I went out there, I had a really bad back. And I was, I was sort of doing a lot of, um, my doctor prescribed me codeine and that for my pain. And that, which is a bit airy with me, because it's still an opiate, you know. And, but, and uh, TB Joshua knew I was in this line and I really stood out, because on my height, these two guys by the side of me were about six foot six. <laughs> And I remember feeling very vulnerable and I had it on a bit of paper because I'd had a few bleeds in my urine that year and there was a lot going on with my body and um, and TB Joshua just pointed out to me, he said, um, this is all to do with your past. See, I never really thought about it, that actually taking codeine, I was getting close to taking morphine, heroin, all those drugs. And um, he knew, and I remember he, he prayed, and I fell down on my knees, and I had fire all over my body. And I remember I could hear him, and he was going around praying for other people. And then he come back to me, and he just went, Father, let it be over. Can disconnect him from his past, in Jesus' name. And I felt everything leave my body, <laughs> the pain, everything. It's just incredible. TB Joshua smiled at me when I walked in his office and he went, Bob, I had a vision about you last night. I said, yeah, and I was getting very scared. <laughs> I was thinking, oh no, you know, and he, and he went, Bob, I saw you carrying your cross. And that was the question I was going to ask him, was I walking right, you know? And, and then he, he turned around and he smiled and he went, not all the time, <laughs> which is true. I, you know, I testify that is true. I haven't always carried my cross, and um, but I've never gone back on drugs. I appreciated everything I learned from TP Joshua. I went out there four times. I got healed from things every time I went, and not only that, the teaching. So I used to spend a lot of time in the Word of God. That's, you know, it's the most important thing in my life, really, is just to understand not the way I want to do it, but the way he wants me to do it. This is why living the Christian life is so exciting, because it's like being on an adventure. <laughs> Every day, you, you don't know. You don't know who he's going to put you with. You know, over the years, he, he showed me, and he sounded mad at the time. He said, you won't have to go anywhere, Bob. He said, the nations will come to you. And I thought, what? And he's going, like, do you know what? Over the years, we've had 
28 kids from California came to help us one summer. We did this weekly event, which was God's idea. Every summer we did a week. 14 years we did it. At the end of the week, we went down the river Itchin in Wood Mill and baptized people that got saved that week. And, and it was never ending. <laughs> Sometimes I baptized 28 people in one go down there. And everything was him. I'd walk down a dip during dip week and the Holy Spirit would say to me, that one's ready, Bob. You know, and I remember once there was a woman there and he said, I walked past her and he said, she's ready. And I, I thought, I'll go and bring her to Christ. He said, not you. He said, get the woman to do it. You know, and, and it was like all a learning curve. You know, the, this is the way God wants us to live, being led by the Spirit and to just to be obedient and do what he tells us to every day, you know. Every day we get opportunities. You know, we can't afford not to tell people. You know, eternity is waiting for all of us at some time. I'm gonna, when, when I get there, I'm going to live for thousands and thousands of years. It's only what I do here for Christ that will last. And that's the most important thing. That, you know, I, I can remember when nobody shared Jesus with me before I become a Christian. And it, and it was like, I could have died and gone out, you know what I mean? It, it's just like, it's so important. We don't worry about what people think in that. But we actually, when we got the opportunity, we just share Jesus. I just think to myself, you know, that's what he left us there for, you know, to bring people to him so he can change their lives. The only way Southampton and Winchester and all these places will change is when everyone comes to Christ. And that's, that's how we saw it on the estate, just by reaching one family at a time. Families that the police used to kick the front door in every week because they were drug dealing and stuff. It was like, instead of me judging them, I've become, you know, they, these guys used to ask me to pray for them. On a regular basis, I would go to court with people on the estate. They're always in court. You know, there was one girl, she was, her dad was a Rastafarian. I brought him to Christ eventually in Winchester Prison. But he, she, she was up in court and I went and spoke up for her. And while I'm in court, all, all that morning I'd sat there with these crack dealers and that, and I was getting fed up with listening to all their prison stories and all their drug dealing stories and that. And, um, and the Holy Spirit just challenged me and said, Bob, how am I ever going to reach these people if you don't sit with them and talk to them? And you know what? In court, I got up, the magistrate asked me to speak up for this girl. And I spoke up and next minute the drug squad had hold of my arm and they were doing a police check on the phone. Do you know what happened? All the crack dealers behind the glass at the back, they all stood up and they shouted out, Leave him alone. Don't you know God's changed his life? <laughs> Should have been filming that one. But like, you know, and, and you realise just how God's in all this. You know, I've seen so many miracles in court. It's unbelievable. You know, I've had some of the hardest judges in Hampshire turn around and thank me for bringing them some good news. Because <laughs> it's all good news with Jesus, you know, and, and you realise that God wants us involved in this mess so he can bring a, make it into a success, you know. And I've seen so many people's lives change, you know, people that you would never given them any hope at all. I had two guys once turn up in my front garden and I had a really bad back and I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Bob, don't let the enemy stop you doing what I called you to do. So I looked at both these guys and I went, do you want to give your lives to Jesus? And the next minute they got tears flooding out of their eyes and they both gave their lives to Jesus. I'm still helping one at the moment, the one with one leg in there, you know. But they gave their lives to Christ. They both lost four brothers to heroin, you know, and it's, 
you, you don't get the chance unless you, you get involved with people. And it is messy. You know, when we lived on the estate, our door knocked day and night. Colette used to say to me when it got 11, 12 at night, don't answer the door. But if the Holy Spirit told me to, I would go and answer the door. And one night I did that, I went downstairs, I opened the door and there's a guy there just covered in blood, you know, and his mates in the car, both of them got blood all over them. And I said, you need to go to A&E. These guys, they, they, they said to me, and it was so surprising because these guys weren't Christians, but they'd been down the area in Southampton, which is a red light area, and they got beaten up. And um, you know what, they, the, the first thing they said to me was, Bob, just pray for us. And like they weren't, but they'd been to one Bible study where well, I was holding, and like, and they just said pray for me, and then they drove off to A and E, but they just come round to get prayer, because people don't know where to go. It's interesting that God, He knows the way into every place. He knows the way to, you know, people. People. Most churches have given up with the flower roads. The courts didn't like people from the flower roads, but God turned it all around. You know, even if one policeman told me once, he said, you know what, Bob, since you and Colette have been there, he said, the crime rate has gone down. And when we did that week in the summer, there was no crime at all, totally crime free. You know, which was unusual for that, and, and it just showed you that God knows what's needed in an area. You know, and instead of going and telling people what's wrong with their lives, they were, it's like me, I knew what was wrong with my life. I didn't need telling. But, you know, we need, we need to know there is hope and there's a way out. And Jesus is that hope. He's the only way. He's the way, the truth, the life. And I think it's in John, he says, my sheep know my voice. That's all we got to do is practice in listening to him. He loves to talk to us. He'd like to talk to us a lot more than what we do, you know. I have good days and bad days with this. I'm not perfect. But I, I, this is the way he taught me, that you need to understand. See, he told me down dip week when we did the summer week that actually all he wanted us to do was show love to these people. So we pay out all this money. We spend about seven or eight grand on, you know, a Velcro, Run, run, and all these games for the kids, and that bucking bronco, <laughs> you name it. We had it, <laughs> and the kids loved it. But you know, when it came to doing things, they would do it. You know, I remember once I was with this kid, and the kids on the minibus tried to say, "Get him up and get him running riot," which you could do. And he said to this kid, he said, "I ain't doing nothing." He said, I, I want to go ice skating again. And Bob said, if I was good, he'd take me again. You know, it's something very simple. You see, what, what people don't understand is they shout at these kids and that. 70% of them haven't got fathers at home. They've got nobody to show them. With Sunday Club, some of the mums would stay and they would watch what we're doing. And I watched all those mums become Christians because they were in God's presence and God was there. He wanted the kids to have fun. You, you've just got to get past what you actually see sometimes. You know, and all those guys that were in the gang, one by one now, they've got kids themselves. And they're on my case. They, they go, Bob, when we were kids, we had Sunday club, we had club sign on a Monday. You used to, we used to have dip week. We used to, used to take us ice skating, you used to take us fishing all this, we want that for our kids, you know, because change will happen, you know, but we can't expect people just to fit in with what we think. It's God knows best. He knows best. I had two families, one with 10 kids and one with 11 kids, and we, we helped them with food. And the great thing was TB Joshua was right behind this as well. He used to, he knew that we were buying school uniforms and things like that. And I remember once he just sent eight hundred dollars over in cash, and just said, "Bob, buy some school uniforms with it." 
he helped me have confidence in what I was doing because I, people used to say, well, what's the point of just giving somebody a bag of food? Well, there is if you're hungry. <laughs> but I always remember those scriptures, is it Matthew 25? I was hungry and you fed me. You know, I was in prison and you come to visit me. It's, it's understanding that's God's heart. You know, I was naked and you clothed me. You know, all these scriptures, he didn't just say them. He wanted his people to live like this. And when, when you show, uh, he started to show me just how powerful kindness is. You know, people just get blown away. You know, I had one guy crying down Dipweek one year. He was alcoholic and he said, I'll, I'll help you, Bob. And we gave him a litter picker and a bag and he started picking up. On the second day, he, he came up to me and he was crying his eyes out. He said, I can't believe it. Nobody's ever shown me kindness in all my life. He said, all you lot, that's all you do. You're so kind. You're so, it's such a powerful thing. It doesn't cost anything, you know, and, it, and it's, it's better than standing there judging people, you know, and, and you see how it just changes people's lives. Even the police don't like to admit it, but like when I first moved back to Southampton, they knocked my door and told me I want welcome in Southampton. <laughs> but, but I've been to meetings with the chief constable and all sorts of people. God gets you in these places, you know. The, like, they didn't have a good word to say about you. You know, they told my dad once that I didn't have any rights. That I wasn't human even, I was just a junkie, you know what I mean? But like, and you realise that you need to give people time before they see the change in you. You know, and God can transform. He transformed the flower roads. He can transform a whole city. But who does he use to transform it? Um, in Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 58, he talks about rebuilding the walls. Who does he use for that? All the people that have got saved that are no longer like that. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible how if you just obey what he's telling you, you can see your area changed. And by the way, it wasn't just all like that. I mean, we prayer walked for 25 years. Every week, every road got prayer walked. And we, God taught us to pray in the opposite spirit. So if there was intimidation, we would always pray for peace in those houses. And it's just feeling his love for these people. Yeah, you know, I, I was told when I was eight years old on the flower roads that I'd go to prison. You know, that's pretty negative speaking over somebody's life. Words are powerful. And, you know, a lot of kids, it's, they haven't got a chance, really. And when you're marginalised like that, you know, you, you ain't got the same opportunities. You don't go to uni. You don't do this. You know, that's why we never charged anything, even for the summer week. People would say to me, you want to charge him a pound? I said, a lot of mums ain't got a pound to give them. <laughs> I, I, I've learned to love those people. You know, God says, love your neighbours as you love yourself. You know, we should love our neighbours. You know, is, is, is understanding the word of God is the answer. You know, if, if we just obey what God tells us to do, we'll see great change in this world. You know, and I, I, I don't want to live any other way. You know, it's the most exciting way of life. I've, I've been in places you, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> you know, we had Princess Anne come down to the Flower of Justice. She flew an helicopter to Eastleigh Airport and came and visited the Flower of Justice, the charity we run. She couldn't believe it. And I got the opportunity, she come in and they introduced her to me and I gave her my testimony. And this policeman with her said, come on man, we've got to move on now. And she said, do you mind? She said, I'm listening to what he's saying. And then after her was the Lord Lieutenant of Hampshire. And she asked me the wrong question as well. She said, how did you become a Christian? <laughs> so I told her, you know, and she said to me at the end of it, she said, 
do you know, Bob, there's something very special happening here. You know, it's, it's, it's understanding. People don't know unless you tell them that we, we've got the answer. You know, it's not trying to push people into doing anything. I had a choice. You know, Ken said to me, have you got the faith of a mustard seed? I don't think I even had a faith of a mustard seed. <laughs> All I knew is that I took one step forward and my life changed. And I'm still changed now, and I'm still here, 72 years of age. And when I was 15, when I started using heroin, the clinics every year told me I wouldn't be here next year. I think they got it wrong. They didn't count on Jesus. And he's the one, he's the one that's made all the difference. I can't take any credit from it except oh, I've tried to listen to what he says. Because it looks impossible. And, it, and it's understanding, you know, not everyone's got the same chances, you know. When you know of all the abuse that's happened on that estate, all the, you know, we got, we got girls and their kids that, you know, they were sold into the sex trade when they were five years old. You know, what chance you got? It's only Jesus, because he just loves you. We can change this world, just one person at a time with Jesus, because he's the one that makes the difference. It's not about knowledge, you know, and I, this is what I love TV Joshua for as well, because I, God showed me this years ago, there are two types of knowledge. There's sense knowledge, which is our intelligence, our ears, our nose, our eyes and that. And most of us live that way every day. But there's also revelation knowledge, which God can give us revelation. You know, as Christians, you've probably read the Bible and you read some chapters and you think, I've read that before. But then one day the Holy Spirit just opens the whole thing up to you. And it changes everything. It just changes, you know. It's so exciting, you know, that and you you realize that there's a there's a god who just loves you he wants you to be successful you know he, he, even when we we're breaking the rules he still loves us you know and his love for us doesn't change like with people it does change <laughs> you've really upset me da, da, da. but jesus don't do that he's not a jesus i know but uh, the thing i would say that that I, I would want to get across to most Christians is live a life led by the Spirit. It's the most exciting way of living. It's about understanding that when you do it, you're doing what God wants you to. To be in God's will is really important and to really be focused on that. On, and understanding when you go out every day, you know, Lord, give me an opportunity. Show me who you want me to talk to. You know, give me the opportunity to encourage someone. You know, I've got a T-shirt by an American lot. Um, it's called Seven, but he's he's got a lot. They go into prisons. But they brought thousands of prisoners to Christ, and it, and he's got on there, Hope Dealer, and that with where the H is, they've crossed out a D. You know, because that's me. I was a dope dealer, but like. It's a hope dealer, and you know what hope means? Helping others prosper eternally. And that's, that's what I live for. If you wanna, you wanna see me happy, it's when somebody's come to Christ. You know, it's just, it's nothing else. I think Proverbs says, it's a wise man who wins souls. I'm pretty sure he's gonna ask us, how many do we bring with us? <laughs> when we get there, but like, he, he's, you can't put it, it's just, if you realise what he's done in my life, it, I've only shared a bit about it, but it's sort of like, it's incredible that he's never given up on me, you know, and I've had my moments where I've got it all wrong, and that, but God is for me, he's not a guy who can be against you, you know, yeah, that's what it says in the word, and understanding that, his love never fails, never fails, ever. 
I think back, you know, I've, I've been through so much, you know, 15 years ago I was told I had hepatitis C, I went on interferon, so that meant I had to go back to skin popping, we call it, just in the muscle, three times a week, millions of units of interferon, then I was told after nine months I hadn't worked, they told my wife I had a year to live. God's saying to me, just trust me, Bob. That next year, they couldn't find it in my body. Every blood test, negative. You know, that's the God I, I serve. That's the God I love. You know, he's never let me down. He's helped me through all this stuff. You know, other, other people might look at this and think, well, you've just been lucky or whatever. No, God loves everyone. He loves everyone. God shows you a side of him that you, you, you don't always see. And we had these couple of months where we had van, the van was full of food, we were on the other side of Southampton, and the Holy Spirit would say to me, go and see so-and-so. Well, we've been helping this Portuguese guy for two years. He was alcoholic as well. And um, the Holy Spirit said to me, go to the hospital. Jose's in the hospital, go to the hospital, Bob. And I, I drive all the way up the hospital. I argued a bit <laughs> about being in the wrong place. But I went and uh, I walk in the ward and Jose is there and he just says to me, I knew you'd come, you know. And I go, you want me to pray with you, Jose? He said, please. I said, do you want to make your peace with God? Do you want to ask Jesus into your life? And he says, yes, please, yes, please. And so he said the prayer. Three hours later, I get a phone call from the hospital. He's gone. He's dead. And that, that same week, I had another woman who was the biggest shoplifter in Southampton. She rang me up from a hospice, and she said, Bob, will you pray with me? And I said, do you want to ask Jesus into your life? And she did. And she made her peace with God. Four hours later, she's dead. I had another woman, and I felt God say to me, go and see her. So I drive all the way over Shirley Warren, and I got there, and the door's like that ajar. Nick, the young guy with me, he didn't want to come in there, because I think he thought, like, she's killed herself or something. So I go there, and she's hanging from the light. So I, and she's cut her arms right open here with a bread knife. And so I lift her up and I'm covered in blood and I got the noose off her neck and then, and then the ambulance comes and takes her away. But they sectioned her and that. But through her, a couple of weeks later, she rang me up and said, Have you, can you help me out with a bit of food, Bob? I go over there and there are six prostitutes in there. And she said, I've told them all about you, Bob. She said, um, they all want to pray. So we stood there in a circle and they all asked Jesus into their life. <laughs> and, you know, it's just, it's a different Jesus, you know. It's, but then he reminded me about the other thief on the cross. He, he couldn't get off the cross and get baptized or make it right. But Jesus said, I see, see you in paradise. You know, it's, it's like he reminds me sometimes <laughs> that I need to, you know, it's not black and white, you know. God, love, God loves his creation. He loves everybody he created. And, he, and he, he does these things so that we can see a different side of him, really, you know. And to be part of that is, a, is an honor. See, Jesus is interceding for me, for you, for all of us. He's interceding for us all the time. He's praying for us. The least we can do is pray for others. You know, we don't understand. You know, it's like Billy Graham when he got saved. You know, look at the millions of people he brought to Christ. There was only three of them walked up the front to give their lives to Jesus. We don't know who we're bringing to Jesus, do we? He could change, the whole, you know, it could be a, a world changer. God's plans are better than our plans, you know. And I didn't have a plan. I didn't, oh, to be honest, I didn't have a plan. I just didn't know how I was going to reach these people. 
because to begin with it was very negative some of it but it's about understanding there's no too big a problem for Jesus. When I when I talk to young people and that they're very surprised when I say to them you know everyone's born with a purpose. Look at me I've wasted 27 years of my life on heroin and yet God's purposes for me never never got wiped out. You know, so I might have delayed everything. <laughs> but God put me back on track again. And he wants to do that for everyone. You know, his love is is hard to quantify really. It's not like human love. You can't earn it. It's like salvation. It's a gift from God. It's grace. Grace is a free gift from God. You know, even if you don't do anything, he still loves you. He still, you know. My, my greatest advice is don't listen to the lies out there. Because the lies out there, this is what I found with a lot of young people, their only hope, especially if you're marginalised, is to win the lottery or to become a celebrity. And when you talk to young people, they all want that. But there's nothing in it. There's nothing in it. It's absolutely... And you look at the people that have won the lottery, 70% of them never wish they'd won it. It's not, it's not about how much money you've got. It doesn't make you a bad person. It actually is it's very destructive. And drugs are the most destructive things. It changes the way you look at yourself and other people. You know, it's not, it's not a good thing. I, I, I would say to you, you know, like, you can't shut this world out. You know, and I think one of the highest death rates now is suicide amongst young people. Don't give the, don't give the enemy of our souls the, you know, to make him happy is to kill yourself, you know. I can remember being in a chemist and I put this amount of heroin in a syringe and I thought to myself, I only push half of it in. This voice inside of me went, nah, do it, push the lot in. You know what I mean? I ended up in hospital overdose and all that. But it's sort of like, God understands. This is a spiritual battle we're in. It's not flesh and blood, you know? And I would say, from my, just from my story alone, don't, don't, don't do drugs at all. You know, I've done drug education. When I come back, I work for Hope UK. And I used to go to all the schools around Southampton, Romsey and that. And I did their drug education. I still meet people today. And they go, you don't remember me, but you did my drug education at school. And I want you to know, Bob, because I only told them my story. And, I, and they said, well, I've never done drugs. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do any of this stuff. He said, after hearing your story, he said, oh, didn't want to, didn't want to do it. It's a waste of a life, and your life is so important to you. You know, it's, and you young people, you're the future. We need to, we need you to make it. We need you to do the things we ain't done. <laughs> if you really want your freedom, you can have it but you need to go to places where you can get your freedom. Have a look at God's Heart TV. Uh, see Chris on there, and he's praying for people caught up in, in the same sort of stuff you are, and you can find your freedom. You can find your freedom just by going somewhere where somebody knows the Holy Spirit and he knows the power of God, and you can have your freedom. And I can't believe how easy it was I can't believe, you know. It doesn't mean God takes your choices away from you. He doesn't. Every day I choose. See, people on the estate used to say to me, Bob, why don't you do this? You always used to get good stuff and that. But, see, I chose every day to live drug-free with Jesus' help. I choose every day to live that, not to live that life ever again. And I'm still here, I'm still here. So I must have something left to do. <laughs>
to encourage you guys that if he did it for me, he can do it for you.